is an emergency. There is no doubt that climate change is the greatest environmental challenge of our time. A disastrous 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures and beyond. The oceans are in a state of emergency. Entire marine ecosystems are vanishing with the warming of the seas. And as the waste of the world empties into our waters, we face the devastating crisis of plastic pollution. Mass drought, mass disease, loss of lands and homes, increased fires, increased tropical storms, mass human displacement and globally exhausted resources. We must act with urgency. Climate change is real and we're seeing the effects now in many places around the world. We're seeing strong evidence of, of changes in the way that the oceans are dealing with this increase in greenhouse gas emissions, which is then leading to things like changes in their temperature, changes in the, the concentration of, of acids in the ocean. And this is having a big effect on species in many different ways. Just outside the Antarctic Circle, which is um, the richest form of Antarctic life of thousands, hundreds of thousands of penguins and seals and so on. The first time I went there was about, about 30 years ago and I had stood at the bottom of the glacier and 10 years ago I went back and stood in the same place and the glacier wasn't even visible, it had just retracted. Hi, I'm David Carter, CEO of Austral Fisheries. Started a deckhand on a prawn trawler 44 years ago, and I am now the CEO, having done many different parts of this business, as you might imagine. So for fishers, climate change is something we live with practically daily. We immerse ourselves in the environment. We rely on the planet to look after us. We are seeing firsthand the changes that are taking place in our oceans. It's just impossible for us to be watching this and not want to do something about it. Uh, our family's been involved in the Abrola scallop fishery since the mid-1980s. We're just a small part of the world and the impacts have been great on us and I'm sure we're not alone. So I'm just looking at you in place of the camera. Okay, I think that the climate change affects Si es que es así, tratando de entenderlo a fondo, eh, afecta en muchas formas. Principalmente, nosotros notamos la temperatura de la, de la, de la, de la, del agua. Uno lo mide con el cuerpo. I think in the Abrola scallop fishery we've already seen the impacts of climate change. Uh, we had a marine heat wave in 2010. 2011, which just fundamentally just wiped out the, the stocks and the fishery took five years to recover. You know, we left the fishery with plenty of breeding stock behind, but come the surveys, the, you know, six months after the season had ended, the stocks had literally disappeared. And seasons come and go, you have good seasons, you have bad seasons, but we really hadn't experienced no seasons. We didn't know at that time that it was going to be five years of no fishing. I think the climate change definitely tiene alguna afectación hacia la pesquería, específicamente, como le repito, a los erizos. Nosotros vemos que las densidades han bajado. Vemos erizos muertos, vemos erizos con espinas. Lo, 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 lo detectamos. Todo el año ellos están ahí pescando, pescando, y es su forma de vida. Comer para vestir, para el estudio de los hijos, todo. Es como una forma de vida, pues, la pesca aquí para nosotros. Ya viene presentándose más fuerte como de hace unos no sé, hay siete años, yo creo por ahí, camarón, lo que sea, se mueren, pues, no aguantan la temperatura. How fish are being affected uh, by climate change in the oceans will vary depending on which part of the world we are in and also which species. Around 200 million people are directly or indirectly employed in the fish and seafood industries, and 39 million people are employed directly by wild capture fisheries. My name is Gus Canslake. I work for Seafish on the regional southwest advisor. Whatever fish you, you are catching, temperature is key. The other difference that we've seen is the rising tides, really. The tidal range seems to be a lot higher now. If you have a low pressure in some of the harbours, particularly around Cornwall, we get flooding on a regular basis now, which we didn't see sort of 10 or 15 years ago. One thinks that the temperature is a factor 
también hay que aceptar que uno mismo una sobrepesca, uno no puede uno negar eso. Pues yo creo que es más importante cuidarlo porque si no lo acabamos, pues no vamos a... ¿De qué vamos a vivir más adelante? Pues la pesca aquí es la, el sustento de todo el pueblo casi, porque hay muchas familias que no tienen otra forma de donde sostenerse, porque no tienen agricultura ni ganadería, nada más pura pesca. Sustainable fishing enables you to continue fishing into the future, while also ensuring that the ecosystem is preserved and maintained. The way that we manage fisheries has for so long assumed that the world is static. That's no longer the case. The world is changing. So we still need to think about the sustainability of the population that we are fishing. We need to think about the side effects on the other species that are being fished or affected. We need to think about how the management system works. And those will not change in the face of climate change. We're finding increasingly that sustainable management might be necessary, but it's not always sufficient. One of the really challenging consequences of climate change is that not all fisheries are going to be able to continue catching fish the way they did before. Ultimately, there aren't necessarily more fish in the sea. You have an effect on the health of the stocks. We can't keep doing what we've been doing before. We need to build resilient institutions that are able to adapt and respond to a world that is very different to the world in which they were originally established. The species that are in one jurisdiction might now be completely different to what was found previously there. In the Northeast Atlantic Ocean, there are multiple states that are fishing on some very large productive stocks that move around in these waters. And all of these countries have, a long time ago in the 70s, reached an agreement on how they would split these resources. But that was based on where the fish were at the time. Once they've moved, countries have not been able to agree on how to readjust how they are sharing this resource. And because they are not recognizing each other's decisions, they are not backing down and reducing their own quotas. The distribution of these species is changing at the moment and some of that is likely to be climate change related, resulting in some stocks being overfished or at least a risk of their being overfishing. So it's very, very difficult for fisheries managers to actually set a level of catches when you've got new species coming into an area. Uh, we're seeing a, a movement in warm water species coming in. Other fisheries have, have seen a, a sort of a negative impact. So if you're a cod fisherman, for example, that fishery seems to have moved north. Fishermen are having to rely on other species, sardines of, of which is one of them. I think in terms of the information and data that uh, we need to collect, the fishermen are in a unique position to collect that type of data. They collect samples of their catches on a weekly basis. They not only measure the catch, they also weigh the catch. So we've got an understanding of actually what's happening year on year. The response is too slow. Decisions are taking too long while the environment uh, is changing much more quickly. The best practice for fisheries involves a management system that is responsive, which means that when things change, they're able to detect it, first of all, and then to make quickly decisions to adapt to that change. Los gobiernos eh, pudieran intervenir mucho. Obviamente que son los que ponen las reglas del juego, pero lo que tendría que cambiar es que tendrían que escuchar y eh, eh, analizar diferentes posturas para que los planes de manejo y las normas oficiales sean realistas y que no se queden fijas. Si el día de mañana llega un investigador de X parte y y descubre algo y se de alguna forma se contempla en las decisiones, pues caray. We will all need to respond to the challenges of climate change. Fisheries, the Marine Stewardship Council, stakeholders, industry, politicians. I think responsibility for addressing the climate change issues, I mean, it really lies with all of us. I think there's a lot of talk about the costs of addressing climate issues, but I think what we have experienced is there's a, there's a cost of inaction of climate change as well. If we're going to feed nine plus billion people, we can't be doing it the way we do it now. Changing the way we view consumption, the sorts of attitudes we have to animal protein even. Instead of protein being centre of plate, it's, it's the garnish to the vegetables. All of those things have to change. We're heading to 10 billion. I mean, this is a profound challenge. 
for humanity to meet the food needs and the protein needs of a growing world, let alone to do that equitably. As a species, we are expert problem solvers, but we haven't yet applied ourselves to this problem with the focus that it requires. We can create a world with clean air and water, unlimited energy, and fish stocks that will sustain us well into the future. But to do that, we need a plan. So what do we need to do? For a start, we need to reduce our emissions. So we, we burn about 9 million litres of diesel a year. In total, our emissions account is around 40,000 tonnes. Uh, we choose to offset all of those emissions through nature-based solutions, and that means planting trees for us. And the real game has to be around reducing our reliance on uh, fossil fuels. We took delivery last year of a vessel called the Cape Arcona. It's most easily described as a, as a Prius of the sea. I would estimate we've probably halved our fuel consumption. So on a boat that would normally burn six to 8,000 litres a day, this boat's consistently in the three to 4,000 litres. But ultimately the, the main game has to be finding ways to use other than crashed up dinosaurs to uh, Running our boats. We can contribute looking at uh, gear modifications to reduce their impact on the seabed, looking at fuel reducing devices, but it's a difficult thing to, uh, to introduce new technology in what is a very, very harsh environment. Fisheries management is the steps that you take to restrict human activity. You don't actually manage the fish, you manage what humans do when they're out fishing. That the complexity is not really the science, it's the, the people behaviour. We shouldn't underestimate the complexity of engaging all of the stakeholders and decision makers in a dynamic system. There is already a lot of science and information that we can draw on. Uh, the hardest thing is bringing it together to make decisions and do that quickly. An example of new cross-border dialogue is how scientists are collaborating in the Bering Sea between the US and Russia. Scientists in both countries are jointly studying the climate change induced northward movement of the very large pollock stocks in the east and west of the Bering Sea. The international border lies in the middle and fish swim to find more suitable habitat, habitat that itself is changing. This information is important to collaborate on in order to understand, in a broad sense, the impacts of climate change. People need to look past short-term self-interest. They'll need to recognise they won't always get the catch that they had before. But in so doing, you guarantee the likelihood that you can keep fishing into the future. Policymakers need to agree to change the way the, the quotas of what each country is allowed to fish are distributed. And that in turn depends on the willingness of all of the actors that uh, are lobbying and pushing for these decisions. So that includes the fishing industry and the, the fishers that belong to all these different countries. <laughs> We have unleashed the forces of climate change uh, that genie's out of the bottle. We'll need to harness the very best and brightest of minds to ensure that uh, we've avoided an ecological disaster, indeed some of those tipping points that could see multiple system failure and collapse. I have grave fears about the future of our uh, marine coral reefs. We've, we've got some serious challenges. There's no climate change deniers in the scallop fishery. Uh, we've, we've lived and experienced it already. My main message to, to government everywhere would be, let's accept that this is something real, something that's happening now. Uh, something that's impacting businesses and communities uh, in the here and now as well. So let's act now and address this issue. We are more reliant than ever on institutions to come up with solutions and to make those solutions effective. 
At the same time, many people are losing their patience with institutions. People aren't delivering. Nobody can afford to be uh, hiding in the corners when it comes to tackling climate. The time for talking is over, the time for action is now. We will only make progress if we absolutely accept that collective action is required. If any nation falls short, we all fall short. Because the decisions we make now will have impacts in generations' time. The climate crisis, my friends, is the test of our times. And while some may still believe it is unfolding in slow motion, no, this test is now as acute and as existential as any previous one. Well, I will not stand aside and watch. I will not be silent while the world is on fire. Will you?